Thomas Workin. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Lizzie Burden. I'm UK correspondent at Bloomberg TV and I also host our Bloomberg UK politics podcast. So here's my plug. It's daily. Feel free to listen. Um, we're not being empty chaired. We're just waiting for Nick Thomas Simmons, who's a busy man and he's on his way, I promise you. Um, but we are here to discuss trade and uh, we haven't heard the B word in Rachel Reeves' speech, but I can promise you I'll be mentioning that as well. Um, this is an event sponsored by IPPR and Santander. Um, as you all know, Keir Starmer has set out his five missions. The first of them is growth for higher standards of living, and obviously exports are crucial to that. At the same time, he's promised to make Britain a clean energy superpower, so echoing Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. And again, selling Britain's green wares is going to rely on effective international trade. So it brings us back to trade policy. So over the next 90 minutes, I know all of you are going to be on tenterhooks for the leader's speech uh, later today. We're going to think about how to align those missions with Labour's trade policy and then how to make them effective in the global context, given effectively we're in this race with the EU, the US and China. We're going to start with opening remarks from our speakers and then we'll move into a panel discussion and then we'll take questions from you in the audience. Uh, so please welcome three quarters of our panel. We've got Gareth Thomas, MP, Shadow Trade Minister. Uh, Marley Morris, Associate Director for Migration, Trade and Communities at IPPR. And John Carroll, Head of International and Transactional Banking at Santander. Thank you all for taking time out of your conference diaries for this fringe event. Uh, John, let's start with you. Okay, so I'll, I'll speak with that and I'll just Do you want a mic, John? Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I, I was at a breakfast this morning where, with the Labour ministers who were talking about the focus on, on trade and its link to, to prosperity. So the first point I would make, it's the right focus. Um, we do research every six months since 2006 in 1,000 companies, some who are internationally trading and some who are not. And the differences are, are, are pretty marked. So those that trade internationally grow much faster. Um, they perform better in the previous cycle and are more confident of growth. We did a survey, the latest survey, two weeks ago. The number one source of growth for these companies in the next three-year cycle is internationally trade. So that focus is really, really important in terms of growth. It's also linked to resilience. So we have, uh, across the group in, in the bank, five million SMEs. Uh, and in normal economic times, in, in, in all of our countries, including the UK, in normal economic times, the default rates on those companies is about four times less if you are an internationally trading SME. But when it gets really complicated is during an economic crisis when the differences are up to 10 times. So you get that growth and resilience from those, uh, from those companies. And, and crucially, if you focus on SMEs in trade, you're much more likely to get that diversified uh, prosperity focus. So, so you're not just gonna happen in London, you also get that prosperity right across the, the country. We also ask the companies, what are those obstacles? What are the obstacles that you have for international trade? And they tend to be uh, grouped around five key areas, five key areas. The first is getting access to buyers. So not just a trade deal, but who will buy my whiskey in India? Who will buy my auto parts in Slovakia? So getting access to buyers is crucial. Second, it's the local regulation, the local quirks, which exist all around the world in Europe, yes, but also beyond Europe as well. Thirdly, it's the cost of logistics and access to logistics, but also diversifying your supply chain, how actually you can get access to, to new importers. You've been dependent on one throughout many, many years. The fourth is getting paid. Yep, a pretty obvious one. And the fifth one, which is really important, is skills and skill set for an SME. So these, uh, you've been trading with France for 30 or 40 years, you're suddenly your product is right for Japan, but your people don't have that skill set. So those are the five broad barriers which companies have, particularly SMEs. Now, to solve those, I don't think it should be all on the back of government. It needs to be private sector and government, and we do things ourselves within the bank to try and help with that. But there are certain things that only government 
can do. Um, and I guess when we talk throughout today, I'll probably be keen to focus on, on four areas and other areas as well. One is, crucially, that second point, regulation. Only government can reduce the barriers or, or negotiate barriers uh, or deals to reduce um, um, those regulations. Now, the most obvious one we'll talk about, I'm sure, will be Brexit and what can be done there. But it also is beyond uh, Europe. And China is a really good example. For those of us who have to deal with China, you are getting very different um, points of view, whether you speak to the, the regulatory authority versus those that are promoting trade. So it is a consistent approach which can actually make it easier to, 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 to deal with regulation internationally. The second key point is there are unfortunately systemic financial gaps in terms of particularly new exporters. So UK, UKF is the uh, authority which is responsible for dealing with the banks. They do an excellent job. There's been real progress in the last few years, but I think more can be done for the new exporters to help that as well. A third key point is on ESG uh, and dealing with supply chains. I think there is a rare opportunity uh, for SMEs who are normally at a uh, structural disadvantage uh, versus larger uh, corporates to deal uh, with international trade. ESG gives them an advantage, we can discuss that, but I think there is a need to support certain SMEs, particularly in terms of validation of supply chains. And a fourth and, and key point where the UK actually is ahead is on the issue of digital trade. There are four billion pieces of paper around the world which services um, trade. It is a paper-based, archaic system. But a couple of months ago, the UK has passed a law to make trade digital, and given that much of global trade happens under English law, there's a real opportunity for UK to set the scene there. So there are four areas where I think we could probably uh, spend some time on as well. All right, thanks, John. Marley. Thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what a um, UK trade strategy could look like. Uh, our concern is that despite the, the kind of new powers and controls that the, that the UK now has over trade policy post-Brexit, there's just a lack of a clear strategy. We had um, the last few years um, a real racking up of uh, trade deals, of securing rollover deals, um, and of um, picking off the, the kind of low-hanging fruit of trade deals in Australia, New Zealand, and so on. Um, but what I think um, we're um, lacking now is, is a clear strategy for what to do next. We've got these, this low-hanging fruit, but what, what, what now? How do we um, build a, a trade policy that supports economic uh, growth? Um, and the starting point um, for us at IPPR is to think about a new approach which focuses on inclusive green trade, um, and that is based and intimately linked with uh, an ambitious un industrial strategy. And that means identifying offensive interests and not just seeking, seeking a trade deal for its own sake, but seeking what can we um, secure as part of that trade deal which will benefit um, UK businesses and consumers. Um, identifying what the, the future growth opportunities might be, whether it's in advanced manufacturing or clean energy, um, and shaping trade policy to, to, to meet this task. So there are three areas that I touch on um, which I think are particular priorities um, going forward and kind of linking um, a bit with what um, John has said already. Um, so firstly, um, diversifying our export base. It's something that we've talked about for a long time at IPPR. Um, and by this we mean really identifying the, the growth opportunities and investing in industrial clusters around the UK, um, learning from what's happening in the US with Biden's um, uh, 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 IRA, uh, and providing tailored support to um, exporters to, um, to boost um, their capacity to um, trade with the rest of the world. So uh, that's a big part of it, and that, a lot of that's industrial strategy, but I think trade and industrial strategy kind of come hand in hand and, and need to be thought about um, as one. Secondly, um, I know, Lizzie, you're going to be uh, keen to kind of talk about this too, the, the, the UK-EU um, relationship, I think, is, is a... It's a real priority going forward and how to look about deepening that relationship in a way to facilitate trade. So I mean, there's been lots of talk about um, kind of a veterinary agreement, um, uh, uh, deepening trade when it comes to um, great creating greater alignment or equivalence on uh, animal and plant health. And certainly that, I think, is going to be critical for, for those industries. I'll give one further example, which we think is a priority going forward is about linking the UK and the EU's emissions trading systems. 
Um, and the reason that we think that's a priority is, is twofold. On the one hand, um, it will help to create a larger carbon market and that will help to support decarbonisation. But on, uh, on the other hand, and I think this is a real priority when you think about the next few years, it's going to be an imperative um, for the UK to avoid new trade barriers emerging because of the EU's um, CBAM, um, its carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is being rolled out. Um, and the only way to avoid the tr those trade barriers in full is for the UK to link with the, the ETS formally. Um, and there are benefits for the UK in doing that too, because then developing um, a, a carbon border adjustment of, of our own will, will help to create a level playing field for um, businesses in the UK and help to address uh, carbon leakage. Um, and then thirdly, um, the, uh, the third area that we that we are keen to kind of explore and focus on more is about collaborating to shape trade rules. So I think the future of trade is going to be so much focus you know, away from from tariff elimination and more on differing standards and regulations about how to how to um, uh, align and manage those those different those different regulations. And that involves engaging with key partners in the U.S., the EU, um, in the Pacific. Um, on, on differing rules. And obviously we're seeing some of these trade tensions emerge at the moment with um, the RA, the Inflation Reduction Act, and with, um, uh, with the EU's uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. Some of these tensions are emerging. I think the UK has an important role to play in thinking about how do you, how do you manage those rules effectively. So some obvious areas are around um, low carbon imports. So I mean the US and the EU are currently talking um, about steel and aluminium in particular and about finding a way to, uh, to negotiate on these issues, but the UK is not in the, not in the room in those negotiations, so I think we think the UK should be playing an, an active role there. Um, on green subsidies, again, linked closely to the IRA, the UK should be playing a role, thinking about what the kind of fair rules are for green subsidies, so that we don't get, um, we don't get you know, an, an unfair playing field across, um, across the globe. And then finally, as John mentioned, digital trade is an increasingly important area, particularly for the UK, thinking, of, thinking about how can have fair rules for data protection to facilitate trade flows, but also, again, ensure that you've got that kind of baseline um, um, between countries that are trading. Um, so those are some of the yeah, initial priorities, but yeah, keen to hear what others have to say too. Well, both Gareth and Nick have told me they want to go last, so <laughs> it's up to you <laughs> who's next. Um, <coughs> well, firstly, thanks very much um, to all of you in the audience for your um, interest, and thanks to IP IPPR and Santander for, uh, for hosting us. Uh, and Marley, good to hear your um, provocative uh, questions um, uh, again. Uh, I should apologize to you all. Uh, two weeks ago at a uh, briefing for shadow ministers, um, not in the shadow cabinet, we were given very strict instructions not to say anything exciting um, on the fringe. Um, shadow cabinet uh, ministers, so Nick, are not under the same, uh, same <laughs> rules. Uh, so uh, all the sex, drugs, and rock and roll around trade will come from Nick uh, very, uh, very shortly. Um, I wanted to, to leave you with three uh, takeaways, uh, one on Europe, one on exports, and one on strategy. But if you'll forgive me, I thought um, I'd just read out uh, a quote from uh, Boris Johnson. Some of you will remember him, um, uh, Prime Minister until last year. Um, he announced uh, on, the, on Christmas Eve, uh, almost three years ago, um, that he'd completed negotiations for the uh, so-called Oven Ready Trade Agreement with the EU. And he said, this deal means certainty. It means certainty for business from financial services to our world-leading manufacturers, certainty for those working in high-skilled jobs in firms and factories across the whole country, uh, and went on to say that there will be now be a giant free trade zone of which we will be a member. And if you remember, there was going to be a great uh, US uh, trade deal done and that 80% of British trade would be covered by specially negotiated free trade uh, rules, empowering British business, uh, turbocharging access to the world's most important markets, a land of milk and honey uh, awaited. Now, uh, one or two of you will, uh, I'm sure, agree that things have turned out slightly differently to that um, sort of wonderful um, scenario that was uh, painted to us. And that perhaps um, is reflected in some of the statistics um, that we've seen uh, just recently, where if you look at uh, trade with key European markets in France and Germany uh, uh, now compared to just before the general election, UK exports and uh, exports of goods and services are down by 14% to France, 17% uh, to Germany. Every other member of the G7 has seen uh, growth in their goods and services exports 
to those countries of more than 20%, 20, uh, 20 which gives you some sense of the impact um, that that badly negotiated uh, trade agreement with the EU has had. More broadly, if you look at the Tory record over the last decade, um, Britain has, uh, uh, is the worst performer on uh, goods and services exports out of all the G7 apart from, uh, apart from uh, Japan. So definitely an impact in terms of, uh, uh, of Brexit and the way in which the trade uh, deal has been negotiated. But other factors have uh, played a part, no doubt around austerity. It is striking that um, the Trade Show Access Program, the crucial uh, trade uh, uh, program that supports small businesses wanting to go to their uh, trade shows to get their first or second um, uh, export contracts has effectively been shut um, for the better part of, uh, of six months and have been uh, steadily cut and cut and cut over the last um, six, or seven, uh, six or seven years. So what would, um, what would, uh, what would Labour do? Um, well, the crucial thing is, and the big, where the biggest opportunity lies, is in trying to sort out uh, our trading relationship uh, with Europe. Uh, you will all um, know, because you're assiduous, I'm sure uh, we're not going into this back into the single market or the customs union, there isn't going to be freedom of movement. But we believe that there is an awful lot more that we could do to improve uh, trade uh, with Europe. Uh, David Lammy had a great quote uh, in his speech yesterday about the TCA being the floor, not the ceiling, of our uh, ambitions for uh, trade uh, with Europe. And I think that's, uh, that's absolutely right. We think there is a great opportunity um, uh, in terms of the TCA review in 2025 uh, to sort out many of the frictions, the, the trade, fr trade frictions at the borders that we're uh, seeing that have pushed up uh, costs uh, for businesses and impacted on uh, jobs and investment here in, the, uh, here in the UK. It's striking that according to the OECD, we have uh, one of the lowest uh, rates of in, uh, investment of, uh, across the OECD. Um, and there's no sign of that changing any uh, anytime, uh, anytime soon. We want to do a veterinary agreement uh, with uh, the EU, which we think will uh, lift uh, significantly the burdens on uh, business in the food and farming, uh, farming industries. Um, and help to uh, reduce some of the some of the inflationary pressures that are, have pushed up um, prices of uh, some of our most basic uh, basics goods. Um, I'll leave, leave Nick to say a bit more about uh, what else we would want to do um, in in terms of Europe. But just on uh, exports uh, more generally, one of the biggest uh, frustrations I hear from businesses here, and in the engagement that we've had over the uh, over the last two or three years has been a sense that government isn't supporting uh, exporters to, uh, to get their goods and services into uh, overseas markets. But whilst uh, it's wonderful to see free trade, trade agreement negotiations taking place uh, left, right and, uh, and centre, um, whatever one thinks of the quality of those, those negotiations, and there's plenty of reasons to be concerned uh, at, where, um, uh, at how those negotiations have been conducted, um, once those FDAs have been agreed, there's little sign that government has geared up uh, to support exporters to take advantage of those, uh, of those exports. Uh, certainly, the numbers getting help directly from uh, government uh, in terms of SMEs uh, massively reduced uh, in, the last, uh, in the last seven, seven years. And the digital offer uh, of support uh, businesses going onto the government's website to find out the information they need uh, about the markets that they think they might have an opportunity uh, uh, in in the future. Um, has been described to us as completely woeful. One business CEO said that he goes onto other countries' uh, websites in the US, uh, for example, in order to better understand the markets that his British business um, could take advantage uh, over uh, overseas. And there is no coherent um, Department for Business and Trade or indeed cross-government effort to help those what we might call the intermittent exporters those who um, almost accidentally export because somebody from abroad phones up and wants to take advantage of a good or service, to help them develop from um, being an occasional exporter into a much more regular uh, exporter. And as John uh, alluded to, all the statistics suggest that firms that regularly export are much more stable financially, grow quicker, the jobs they offer are better paid um, than um, jobs of uh, firms that don't uh, export, that just um, produce
um, for the uh, domestic, uh, domestic market. So one of the challenges for us is how do we help small and medium-sized businesses in particular take advantage of the deals that we do have um, and the opportunities on our um, doorstep to go forward. It's one of the reasons why Nick um, last year at this conference announced um, plans uh, to set up climate uh, export hubs in every region and nation uh, of the UK to take advantage of the green energy uh, revolution which uh, Marley alluded to and which you will have heard uh, much about from Ed Miliband and others um, on the uh, conference floor. Just lastly on strategy, one of the things that we want to do early in the uh, life of the next uh, Labour government, if we're lucky enough uh, to get elected, is to publish a trade uh, white paper setting out the values and the principles by which we think uh, trade should be governed. We don't want a race to the bottom, as the Tories seem uh, intent on. We do want commitments around labour standards. Uh, we do want to think through the issues around human rights, animal welfare, etc. But there are then a whole series of other critical uh, questions around access to critical minerals, uh, supply ch building more supply chain uh, uh, resilience, what do we do on the international stage around uh, issues such as the future of the World Trade Organization that we want to think through? And then what are the key uh, support deliverables that we should be offering in terms of that very direct, very tangible support um, to, business, uh, to business going forward? So I think uh, from the look of you all, I've succeeded in not being exciting. And now I'm very delighted to hand over to Nick um, to be <laughs> much more exciting and uh, glamorous going forward. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gareth, and no pressure having had that little introduction. I mean, I, I should just say, first of all, thank you to the IPPR and to Santander, and I, I do think it's great that there is this level of interest in this, because for so many years, of course, the European Commission was negotiating our trade deals, and frankly, there was a lot of work going on, really good work going on in Brussels, but barely got a mention in our media. And we do at least now have this level of interest in trade policy, which I think is important. And I'm very grateful to the IPPR for the work that they are doing on this as well. I think one of the many problems of being in our position is you have very little in terms of human resource. So we do rely on outside bodies to help us in terms of the arguments they put forward and the information they give us. So that's greatly appreciated. I should say something about my new role, first of all, because there's something wonderfully British, isn't there, about shadow minister without portfolio. Though I did ask one of the previous holders of this particular office how they interpret it, and uh, his instant response was, shadow minister without portfolio is, of course, shadow minister of all portfolios, and bear that in mind. But before I alarm too many of my, my shadow cabinet colleagues with this, I should say that Amongst the responsibilities I now have from constitutional matters, public inquiries, is our, relation, is our relationship with the EU. And I want to talk a little bit about that in a moment, but also a bit as well about our relationship with the United States, because I visited the United States uh, this summer, and I just want to say a few words about that. But firstly, as Gareth has set out, we're not looking to relitigate the issues of the past, but that doesn't mean there isn't a great deal we can do that is in the interests of both the EU and the United Kingdom for the flow of trade going across uh, the channel and elsewhere. And there is, th there is firstly, I think, a away from trade, but it's so important, a new security and law enforcement relationship. And that is part of what we want to do in terms of the reset. In terms then of trade, I think we should negotiate a veterinary agreement with the EU. I think we should have that minimal level of checks on whether on agricultural products and indeed agri-foods. New Zealand has uh, such an agreement with the EU and they've managed to take physical checks on goods down to about 1%. That is clearly in the interest of both the EU and the EU. And service exports, which Gareth mentioned, I don't think we shout enough about our services exports. When I travel around the world, our gold standard service exports are often mentioned from our insurance sector, our financial sector architecture, uh, my old profession of the law. They still have a great reputation around the world. We should make more of our services exports. I think we need a mutual recognition of professional qualifications negotiated with different EU member states to enable us to have that opportunity to, to spread that service excellence across the continent. And also, by the way, what 
dogma or ideology led the Conservatives to smother our touring artists in red tape. Who wouldn't want our brilliant touring artists out in the EU? They're a great source of soft power and a great showcase of British talent, and that's what we should be doing. And the other message as well that I think is so important in terms of our negotiations with the European Union is that it is unsurprising that they have come to lack trust in the recent British government. They negotiate treaties, they then denounce them, and uh, Gareth there read out some of the things Boris Johnson was claiming on that Christmas Eve uh, back in 2020, but he was very quickly denouncing it. And I never thought either, by the way, having been a lawyer, a barrister here in the United Kingdom, and having respect for the rule of law, which I thought was one of the central things that defined our politics, to hear a Secretary of State for Northern Ireland in the House of Commons say that we were going to break international law, but not to worry because it was only in a limited and specific way. When I was a, briefly a criminal barrister, that defence, I assure you, would not have worked before our courts. And it, it is something that I'm afraid has done damage to our international reputation. So we will have to say clearly, look, we're not going to always agree whether we're negotiating with the EU or anyone else. But if we disagree, it will be in bad faith. It will not be in bad faith. We will be good faith partners that will act with a strategic maturity that I think is so important. And the one thing we've done as an opposition to demonstrate that has been our approach to the Windsor framework, where Gareth and I actually went through the lobbies with the government to support it, partly because peace in Northern Ireland and that settlement is not something we would do anything to put at risk. I think the Good Friday Agreement is one of the great achievements of Labour governments of, of the last century but also to show to the EU that we're not interested in political gains on something this serious. We also uh, have a sense of relief about the UK's return to Horizon and to Copernicus, though you have to ask what government ever thought it was a good idea to be outside those things that are clearly to our mutual benefit to be collaborating on. So I'm very ambitious on what we can do for our relationship with the EU. It's our biggest trading market. We want that trade to be... Uh, as free as it possibly can be, and that's exactly what the next Labour government will try to do. A lot is made sometimes of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement Implementation Review, which would start in 2025 to go into May of 2026, but the reality is that we're looking to do something far earlier than that in the next Labour government to reset the relationship, and that's what we are determined to do. I also want to say a word, if I could, because this is about boosting trade more generally, uh, about the United States, because a number of shadow cabinet ministers have been to the United States uh, in recent months, and Rachel Reeves given a speech in Washington, I've given a speech to David Lammy, John Healy, our regular visitors too. And we do take a lot of inspiration from the Biden administration, indeed as well, some of the work we often miss that is going on at state level. I visited... Uh, trade Point Atlantic with the governor of Maryland, Wes Moore. And it seemed to me to be a model project in terms of the green transition. So Trade Point Atlantic in Maryland is where there was once the world's largest steelworks in the late 1950s, Bethlehem Steelworks. It's now a distribution port, but also a renewable energy hub. And there's an area there where in the Second World War, new ships were being launched down the slipway. What's now being launched down the slipway are the wind turbines that will create this huge offshore wind hub that will be in the North Atlantic. And that's being done with a government that is working in partnership with business and in partnership with the trade unions as well. And in fact, I was stood with Wes Moore in front of the huge billboard advertising that project and unionized jobs is central to that going forward. And I think when Joe Biden has said, when he thinks climate, he thinks jobs, 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 that is precisely the approach that we take to the green transition as well, seeing it being jobs-led. Also, too, there's been a great deal of interest in the speech that the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, gave at the Brookings Institute uh, some months ago. But the central lesson I take from that, and this idea that the, the globalization as it once was has moved into a new phase, is that we have to get resilience into supply chains around the world. Otherwise, we are very vulnerable to shocks such as Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine. 
But in other areas too, where hostile powers choose to hold us to ransom for particular materials. And where I think this is really important is in the green transition with critical minerals. Now, unfortunately, the nickel, the cobalt, the lithium, they don't occur in the world in places where necessarily we share that many values with the countries that actually own them. And that's why what Jake Sullivan is talking about and others is that, what do you call it, near-shoring, friend-shoring, reshoring that we actually have allies around the world able to come together, whether it's with critical <coughs> minerals, and by the way, the Prime Minister should conclude a critical minerals agreement with the United States uh, as soon as possible, to make sure that when there are unexpected and awful events around the world, we are in a position not to see the kind of shocks that we've seen in the global economy and affecting us domestically. And I think I'll, I'll finish on, on this point, so I think it's a really important point. Jake Sullivan has said that there is a link between domestic policy, foreign policy. He's absolutely right about that. And with my, my shadow cabinet office hat on, I often think it's that joining up that we need to do, whether it's development policy, trade policy, foreign policy, but indeed how it affects investment decisions in the UK. And without creating an additional job for myself, I hope that it is that coordination and sense of strategy we will need as we try to rebuild Britain's reputation on the international stage. Thank you very much. All right, thank you all. It sounds like you've got a big job <laughs> if all those departments get merged and you get in, but thank you all for your opening remarks. Um, Gareth and Nick, you both talk about how you want to see a closer relationship with the EU, even though you wouldn't want to rejoin the customs union. Um, so I wonder, Gareth, I'll ask you, where you think the UK should diverge, given you might ask, What's the point of Brexit if there is no divergence at all? Well, I, I'm <coughs> I would start, I think, from the point of uh, view in saying what we want to do is to sit down with the, with the EU and look at um, from the basis of, of what is needed for our businesses um, to succeed and to, uh, and to prosper. So where, um, to answer very directly your point, if there was a, an issue which for our businesses meant, uh, after we've looked at it very carefully, meant that there were good grounds to diverge from what the EU was doing, on that basis then um, we would see divergence as being perfectly reasonable. Um, but you enter, um, you, we would want to enter negotiations with the EU, for example, uh, on, a, on a veterinary agreement after we'd consulted with businesses to, as, as to how they wanted to approach us, uh, uh, for example, on, on that area. Um, we've had one or two areas that have been flagged to us uh, as uh, areas where there might be potential um, issues and where divergence might be appropriate, albeit a broad uh, veterinary agreement would still be, still be worthwhile. So um, what we don't want to see is if you like, divergence used as an excuse to, to lower standards. And that's clearly where uh, the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg Re, Rees see the argument for uh, divergence as being about. So if there is a very, very strong business case uh, to diverge, then absolutely we'd, lo we'd, look at, we'd look at that. And John, you mentioned um, the importance of regulation. What would business want to achieve in terms of this reset with Europe? I think there's a, there's a couple of key points from the last survey, which I said just from a, from a couple of weeks ago, which gets launched um, next week. 41% um, of companies who trade with Europe say it's become more time consuming since Brexit was implemented. 30% higher tariffs. So clearly the non-tariff part is, is not, not working. Practical things can be made. So, and, and I guess Labour supported this, so it's a positive. 74% of companies using the Windsor Agreement saying it's working well. So some practical things can, can be made to, to, uh, to make a real difference, and I think the veterinary agreement's a, a really good, good start. The reason why it's so important, and here's probably the, the shocking thing for all of you, thinking that the, the growth of the, of the global economy and other parts of the, of, of the, of the universe, it, it probably is, but you ask these same companies, where will growth be in the next three years? The number one market is still the EU, by the pure weight of trade that currently exists. Now, other markets are growing, the Middle East, um, Australia, parts of Asia, and the US, but the EU is still the key part, uh, the key trading partner for the UK and still for the next few years to go. So practical things need to be, to be done. I think you need to listen to business, but there are, you know, the Windsor Agreement is an example of things which can make a real change.
Nick, on this SPS deal that you want with the EU, how quickly do you reckon you could do that after a general election? Would you be waiting for 2025, or do you think actually you could strike it quite quickly? Well, I, I wouldn't want to create a, an artificial deadline for it, but I think I can say this, that we certainly have no intention of waiting until the end of that period for the implementation review. It's something we would want to get started on very quickly. And we would want to get started on it very quickly because it is a real mutual benefit. We have a cost of living crisis here in the UK. We want to be in a position to put food on people's tables more cheaply and more easily. It makes great sense. And my understanding is that one of the previous governments actually turned down the opportunity for the veterinary agreement, which I think is a triumph of ideology over putting the interests of people here in the UK first. So we'd want to get started very quickly on that. Okay, Marley, I wonder how you reckon these negotiations with the EU would go if and when Keir Starmer, if he gets in, uh, tries to renegotiate the terms of the Brexit deal in 2025. Because isn't the reality that the tone might change, but the EU isn't likely actually to budge much on its terms, given that Brussels officials have got bigger fish to fry? I mean, I think it will be challenging, and um, it's clear that the EU, from its perspective, thinks that the TCA works well enough. Um, and so in order to, um, to, to get a, a kind of op reopening of the TCA, I think there's going to have to be a kind of a, a real consideration, a real review and, and, and consideration of what the UK can offer in return and how, what the mutual benefit might be of closer collaboration. I think on some areas it's less clear and in some areas it's more clear. Part of the reason why I focused on the... The, the, on the climate environment cooperation. I think that's actually an area where there could be real mutual benefit and where there would be willingness to, to consider. There's a clear benefit for the, for the EU, for instance, in thinking about linking on, on ETS and about kind of thinking about cooperation on, on, on climate, given that's a massive priority for them in any case. I think there are other areas where there, there might be willingness to cooperate. But um, yeah, it, it, I, I think it will be, it will be tricky. Um, and I think it's also worth you know, the, the, the review in, the, in and of itself is not necessarily, um, I think in the EU's mind, it's not necessarily a, a question of reopening the entire deal. It's about s seeing how it's going to be operationalized and implemented. So in a way, I, mean, I think it makes sense for Nick to say, well, let's just get on with it straight away, because I don't think it's necessarily tied directly. I don't think the negotiations would need to be tied directly to the, to the, um, to the review in 2025. I was, I was just going to add, I mean, I think it's... Uh, I, th I think what perhaps we haven't fully sort of grasped here in the UK is that there's also pressure from within Europe, from within European countries, for um, the TCA review um, to be used to sort out some of the frictions that German and French and Spanish businesses are having getting their goods um, into the UK uh, as well. So, you know, we will have allies in in the discussions that we have um, with uh, with Brussels. And uh, I think, you know, they, the, the Commission understands that we're not seeking to reopen the fundamentals. We're not seeking to rejoin um, the single market or the, uh, or the customs, uh, customs Union. It is about trying to make um, the fundamental decision of the British people uh, work much better and uh, ease a lot of the trade frictions that, um, you know, the deal did not envisage being, uh, being, being in place or which people certainly didn't didn't vote for. So I, th I think there's r absolutely, I understand the reasons why Mali is cautious, um, but I think we will have more allies than perhaps people think in the uh, in the negotiations. You were gonna ask yeah, yeah, just, just to pick that up really, I think as well, the, the TCA as it stands, obviously the checks here have not been implemented yet. The government keeps spending money on things, then delaying them. Uh, and of course the, EU are not pushing for them to be implemented. Why, why would they? Because they will increase the burden on EU businesses that are trading across the channel. But I think there is a real window of opportunity. Take the veterinary agreement, for example, and other things where we can really try to the mutual benefit of businesses in the EU and businesses here not to be putting this, uh, these additional barriers up, which would be, in my view, unnecessary and self-defeating. So thinking about the sort of compromises that could be made, obviously defence is front of mind this week. Gareth, would a Labour government support a UK-EU framework agreement that says that UK personnel can take part in EU military missions? 
Well, I'm pleased to say that is absolutely uh, not in my portfolio. That is uh, very much a, uh, a shadow defence um, uh, issue. And um, uh, John Healy, were he here, I'm sure would be delighted to answer that. But uh, I'm going to uh, duck that question unashamedly. It's, uh, I'm afraid it's not, my, not, not in my brief to, to make that call. Nick, all the briefs are yours. <laughs> Do you know the answer? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but best not commit uh, UK forces to military action in the first few weeks of the job, I think. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I, I do think, though, that there is a broader point here, and that is ra around we, what we would be interested in is a broader security pact with the EU. And this is something that we could do, I believe, very early in the term of the, the next Labour government. And there's a strong set of strategic reasons why you might want to do this, because... We've seen the war in Ukraine. We've seen what Putin's illegal invasion has done. But not only that, if you look at the uncertainties that exist around the world, there's a strong mutual interest between the UK and the EU, shared values you know, uh, about liberal democracy that we want to see <coughs> flourish around the world. And I think it makes perfect sense to work very closely with the EU. And that's something we would like to formalize in the early part of the next government. Marley, if Donald Trump is re-elected in the US, surely that would push a Labour government into closer alignment with the EU rather than the US? Um, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, uh, I think, well, I mean, in some ways, I mean, uh, despite the many differences between um, Trump and Biden, there is the, the one area where there, there is some continuity is on trade policy. Mm -hmm. So it, in, in some ways, you know, um, you probably wouldn't see, you, you didn't see such a big change um, between Trump and Biden on trade, um, as people expected. Um, and you might not see you know, such a big difference if, if there was a return to Trump. But I think ultimately, because of the, the kind of question of, of underlying values, yes, it would mean that the UK and the EU would probably be, 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 be working closer together. Um, I, I, think, I think there were some big questions, I guess, about um, in particular, um, how trade and climate c would work together in, um, under, under a future U.S. administration. So it's interesting at the moment, there's quite a lot of appetite in the U.S. for um, a carbon border adjustment of their own. Um, and among Democrats and Republicans, the Republicans want a, a carbon border adjustment um, that is perhaps more targeted at China, that is more targeted at, um, that is less about, are fundamentally about climate. It's more about it's more about kind of um, uh, domestic protectionism. Um, if that was the case, and that you can imagine that being a big a big challenge for the UK, because then you'd have a real breach between the UK and the U and the US about how how um, how you manage kind of climate and trade issues. And in that case, I think there's a really st a stronger case for the UK and the EU collaborating, linking their ETS. If you get a continued Biden administration, you can imagine actually a more interesting dynamic where the UK could perhaps play um, a role in negotiating between the US and EU. This currently at the moment we've got the global arrangement on sustainable steel and aluminium, which is happening. Um, well, uh, we'll see if it happens, but certainly negotiations are happening. And actually the UK should, I think, be playing quite a, 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 a kind of mediating role between those. It, it's got, on the one hand, it's got an emissions trading system, so it's in some ways quite similar to the EU. On the other hand, it's got a similar outlook to the US on, on other issues and obviously has a special relationship. So you, you can imagine it, it playing a useful role, particularly if, if Biden continues into a second term. So sticking with the US, because Nick, you did mention your visit recently, Politico reported last week that the US and the UK could wrap up a trade deal before <laughs> both countries' respective general elections next year. Would you make concessions on agriculture um, the way Joe Biden's been demanding? Well, I, I can't tell you what the trade-off is, obviously, because I'm not at the negotiating table. I mean, when I went out to the United States, uh, obviously the Biden administration hasn't really been completing free trade deals with, with other countries at all, but I, what the message I was taking was that there are sectors, I was suggesting the digital sector when I was out in the United States where we could have far closer cooperation. Look, of course, uh, our sister party is the Democrats and I hope that the, the Democrats are re-elected, but whoever the US president is and whatever challenges we face, I think we should all say too that the special relationship is between two peoples. It, it goes beyond whoever the president happens to be at any given time, I think. All right, I also want to talk about China. John, what is your view on 
China in terms of how labor should be navigating trade with what is the world's second largest economy, because clearly it carries massive political risks for business. It's an easy one for you both when you get in power. So uh, China is very complex, and um, I guess there's a, there's a few inconvenient truths about China. On, on, on one side, obviously, um, genuine and uh, you know, well-founded security concerns, which will obviously need to limit the trade in certain sectors um, for China. But then on the other side, you have a few other inconvenient truths. One is that uh, if you're looking at growth and trade as being fundamentally important, there are certain parts of the, of the world where China will dominate demand. So 30% of luxury goods globally, the demand will be in from China by the end of this decade. Um, you then look at supply chains, and I agree with Nick, it'll be a, a really, really important issue. Um, but from our recent survey, 70% of wholesalers in the UK and 58% of manufacturers have a dependence on a Chinese supply chain. Now, half of those are looking to diversify, but less than 10% completely. So you have a really big issue there in terms of, of China. You then have a big issue in terms of that link to ESG. So if you want to show that you actually have sourced from the right type of supplier in China, um, it's a bit easier for Primark and Vizara, which have hundreds of people to go and, and, and check in the factories. Not if you're an SME, you have a real problem. Uh, and we can touch on ESG in a second, but that's a real, really big issue in terms of supply chains. And the third thing is tech. So do you say we should just not export any tech to China? Well, certain sectors, yeah, but China also has a massive target to actually achieve net zero as well, and a real challenge. Uh, and the UK is particularly strong in, in green tech. So do you want to then not prohibit that, which could also help um, feed jobs here? So at the moment, for us who deal with SMEs and trade in China, there is a lack of a coherent approach uh, in terms of how the government deals with China. Some parts want you to completely ignore it, and other parts want you to, uh, to engage it. So I think the Chinese policy will be crucial in the, next, in the next government. Nick, I'll let you come back on that. I am just really interested in John's point about how SMEs don't always have sight of their full supply chain. They can't always afford to know what's going on at every point. So how do you make your policies on workers' rights add up with trade with China? Right, well, I'll, I'll come to China specifically in a moment in terms of our approach to it. But I do think in terms of SMEs, we've got a lot of work to do. A lot, a lot of the time, this is about confidence and it's about information. And I don't think we do anywhere near enough. I and mean, I find the government website difficult to navigate, frankly. And I think we need to have a far more proactive approach if you've agreed an FTA to then how businesses can actually go out and, and take advantage of them. I think the, 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 there are three parts to Labour's approach on China. The first is the challenge, and it is a security challenge that we are very robust uh, about dealing with. Um, whether that is you know, in the more security stroke espionage area, whether that is in terms of intellectual property, whether that is in terms of cyber, we've got some of the very best security services uh, in the world uh, here in Britain, and that is a really important aspect of it. The second bit I would suggest is competition. And where I think this is relevant is in terms of the green transition and indeed sustainable trade. And, it, and, I, and I think we've got the starting gun, the starting pistol has been fired uh, on the race for the jobs of the future. At the moment, we don't even seem to be at the starting blocks. I mean, the US have the Inflation Reduction Act. The EU is responding in kind. China is competing very strongly in a number of tech and other things that have already been uh, mentioned. And I think that's going to be important too. The third part of it is, of course, the cooperation aspect, because there's, what, 100 billion, I think, of UK trade uh, with China. There's supply chains that, frankly, would be extraordinarily difficult to unravel, even if you were aware they existed, uh, frankly. So I think what we've got to have is certainly de-risking the UK-China relationship, but I think it is a complicated relationship that we see as under those three headings. Well, very briefly, you mentioned China's tech. Should they be coming to the AI summit in November? Well, that, that, that's, a, that's a slightly different, um, slightly different issue. Can I just say something on AI just for the just for the minute, though? Because we have this summit in the autumn, and we've got this quite extraordinary revolution that is going on. I, I, I think the 18th, 19th century revolutions were industrial revolutions were about replacing what human muscle can do. This is about uh, essentially what human brain power can do. We do need to have guardrails, something like 
the nuclear non-proliferation treaties we had in previous generations. We need some guardrails as to what is the purpose that AI can be used for. We do need some restrictions around, you know, AI that can regenerate itself, which is the, gets all the, you know, the, the negative headlines at times. But we need to see how this quite remarkable transformational new technology can be harnessed uh, for people's benefit going forward, I think. I understand that's the point of the summit, to try and work out what those guardrails should be. So to, put it, uh, to just put it to you again, should China have a seat at the table to work out those guardrails? Well, I, I won't get into calling on China to do one thing or another with it, but I think that, look, we've got to find a solution, whether it's this particular summit or something else, but clearly we've got to have a situation where the biggest economies of the world are all in some sort of similar place. Okay. So the other trade deal that Bloomberg reports is close to getting over the line is with India. Gareth, what would Labour sacrifice to get that over the line? Well, I think the, uh, the issue with, um, with the India deal is essentially how ambitious um, the British government is, is seeking to be with, uh, with India and how willing India is to, is to reciprocate. So there are potentially huge opportunities for, um, for, for, the, for Britain's services industry if um, India is, op is willing to, uh, to, open, to open up, um, as well as the sort of well-publicized uh, aspirations of um, uh, industries such as those around Scotch whiskey, um, and cars wanting to see substantial reductions in, um, in, in tariffs. Um, what's not fully clear is what India is asking for um, in, um, in return. Um, and uh, I suspect we're not going to get told until literally uh, Kemi Badnock or more likely Rishi Sunak um, stand up and announce that they've, uh, they've done, a, done a deal. In the past, India has certainly wanted um, to see more uh, mobility, more access for its professionals um, into um, into the UK. So it will be very interesting to see uh, whether Sunak has overridden Suella Braverman on uh, on that issue to uh, to, to do a deal. Um, what we're hearing is that uh, this is a deal that India sees as important um, as more important in geopolitical terms rather than in uh, in, uh, in trade terms. Um, but whether that's uh, what it actually looks like in, in practice remains to be seen. But certainly it's a deal that in principle we are very supportive, uh, supportive of. But um, unfortunately, given that the scrutiny process in the UK is very poor, um, you know, we, don't, we don't know the terms on which the British government are approaching that, uh, that deal. Um, and that's something um, in the longer term that we want to try and fix, as I say, as part of our discussions around a trade white paper going forward. Okay. Um, thank you, Nick, for joining us. Um, so we are going to take questions now. If you'd have a question, put your hand up. Please tell us who you are and um, who you'd like your question to go to. Um, yep. uh, oh. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Jack Semple. I'm Secretary to an Alliance of Trade Associations and Machine Tools, Tooling, Automation, Robotics, and so on, uh, the Engineering and Machinery Alliance. Absolutely delighted to hear Gareth's comments about the Trade Show Access Program, which was not only saw reduced funding, but was very badly administered, which reduced its effectiveness. And um, we'd love to see if, uh, something come back on that. All my members are really committed to working with ex uh, 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 their exporting sectors, uh, companies in their sectors that export. And uh, what we've seen, I think, in, in the last two or three years is a reduction and a narrowing of export ambition in the UK and we'd love to see that restored and if I could just uh, put a plug for trade associations our fantastic low-cost partners uh, we heard about how uh, consultancy costs have gone up fourfold in six years we charge very little if anything at all but I wanted to ask about the the Brexit the Brexit point uh, or the, the TCA and divergence almost all the debate is on whether the UK should diverge or not and I, our members have a sense that that really has substantially gone in the past as a debate. That's not so much of an issue, although it is an issue. Passive divergence, however, is a really important point. 
So if Labour comes into effective power in 15 or 18 months' time, we will, by that stage, be in a different regime from the EU because it will itself have moved on from the regulations and standards, in, in many cases, that we have inherited. And at the moment, we don't seem to have a process for monitoring that change that is taking place in Brussels. And I wondered if, 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 if you had thought on that and how you will approach that issue. So, well, it's very interesting what you say about the, uh, the trade show access program. Let me just, just comment on that. Uh, one um, trade body was commenting on a, a trade show that uh, they had um, taken some businesses to in, uh, in the States. And um, the British delegation was essentially a quarter of the size of some of our um, European um, competitors, uh, simply because of lack of funding and clearly lack of support from the Department of Business and Trade. And that is, just feels like a bonkers situation to be in when we're a, a country at the bottom of the G7 um, growth league. So we've got to turn that round. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Rachel Reeves yesterday w set out a very clear policy around fiscal responsibility. So I uh, can't yet um, set out for you um, the sort of financial uh, sums or uh, practices, but we're actively looking at um, what we can do in, um, in that space um, going forward. Just on um, passive alignment or passive de-alignment, um, wh what's clear to us is that the, I mean certainly when I was, when I was in government uh, last, there was a very strong European secretariat uh, located in the cabinet office and with very strong um, European uh, teams of civil servants in both the Department for Business um, in its various um, incarnations and um, in the Foreign Office. And it seems that we have actively lost that capacity to understand what is going on in Europe, both in terms of its, its politics and, you know, its regulatory, uh, regulatory changes. And, you know, that is a ridiculous situation to have left ourselves, to, to have let ourselves get into, and we're going to have to uh, address that very, uh, very directly. Whether you do that at, at Cabinet Office, whether you do that in the FCO, whether you do that in the Department for Business, you know, that, that frankly is something we'll have to sort out very quickly when we get into, when we get into government. And that's part of the reason that, you know, we've brought, uh, Keir's brought Sue Gray um, into our, um, operation is, is to begin to think about the preparations for, um, f for for government, you know, and that type of issue is uh, and how you respond to it is obviously one of the things we need to th we need to think about and get right. Right, Emily Jones, University of Oxford. Thank you for a very stimulating panel. Um, I think I have a question actually that leads directly on from that, which is the machinery of government um, and the mechanisms for both consultation with stakeholders, because I think we haven't got that right yet. Um, you mentioned parliamentary scrutiny, so a little bit more detail on that. And then the cross-whitehall coordination, because it hasn't been very good, frankly, on trade policy. Um, and I think particularly with these issues of um, national security, de-risking of supply chains, we've got the sort of national security component, we've got the old sort of, in, we've got now a much more strategic industrial policy that's going to have to link with trade. Um, ag, right, it's got to go right across the piece. So what does that coordination, so beyond the EU, what does that coordination look like? Thank you. So the, to the straight answer is I don't know yet. But um, part of the reason why we want a much more open dialogue with business, with unions, and with NGOs is because the questions that get posed and the comments that come in the dialogue help us to address much earlier on the, the challenges that trade, trade policy throws, uh, throws up. Um, and, you know, my, my own experience of being a trade minister under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown was that um, the questions that NGOs in particular asked were always inconvenient, and they often came at a very inconvenient time. But, it was, they, were, but they were really useful in thinking through the issues and making sure you were absolutely on top of the brief. And I, I just I take the example of the rules of origin problem that car manufacturers have got at the moment in terms of the, of the components for electric um, electric engines, and you know if well, I mean there's an issue about whether about the dialogue with Brussels and uh, and why um, the that hasn't been activated in a proper way for car manufacturers, but um, if dialogue had been taking place more openly, more easily, and um, government was determined to listen to business, uh, some of the discussions.
uh, with, uh, with Europe could have happened a lot earlier in the process and perhaps a solution could have been found um, uh, by, uh, by now. As it is at the moment, a whole series of investment has been stalled, uh, if not lost, um, and that is a crazy situation to have been in. So the starting point, I think, for us in terms of the mach machinery of government uh, changes is how do you have uh, a conversation with all the different stakeholders on trade, which obviously protects um, you in terms of the need to have confidential negotiations with your negotiating partners in, uh, in a point, but also allows you to get access to, uh, to the very best uh, from what the, of what those stakeholders can, uh, can offer. Um, and in a sense, you know, having as your backstop the argument that, I'm sorry, I can't get that through Parliament, um, you know, is actually a useful um, tool to have, and that's why parliamentary scrutiny, uh, improving parliamentary scrutiny would actually be a, a helpful thing to, to have as well. So, you know, at this stage I've said we want to get out, uh, get a trade white paper out early in the uh, process and that will be the discipline to um, begin to think through some of these challenges on a cross-government um, cross basis. It will never be perfect, but it could be an awful lot better than it, than it is now, absolutely. Hi, I'm Grace from the Institute of Export and International Trade. Um, thanks for a great discussion. It's been really interesting so far. And um, my question is about um, SMEs and e-commerce exporting, um, actually, because there was a report released last year from the Social Market Foundation showing that 70,000 businesses in the UK could be supported to start their exporting journey um, by participating in e-commerce and being supported to do that. Um, and off the back of that, we at the Institute set up the E-Commerce Trade Commission to start collating resources and, and supporting businesses um, on that journey. So I was just wondering, Gareth, and open to the panel as well, uh, what do you see the future of e-commerce um, exporting being? And, and Gareth, with the white paper, will it form potentially part of that uh, as a major section which could support British businesses with their export journey? John, I'm going to go to you because I think Gareth deserves a little breather. Absolutely. <laughs> he deserves a drink. So I, I think it will only grow e-commerce is, is, is crucial. I think I'll, I'll keep going back to the five points I mentioned about the challenges for an SME. So that's, they're the ones who really should, should answer that question and they tell us what it is. So, so for example, what we're trying to do is to help SMEs as well. So we have a platform called Navigator which helps you across those five steps. So we're telling companies where there is demand and where there's not. So for example, there's been lots of demand in uh, Singapore for eyeliners post COVID because people were wearing masks, and so they basically increased. So that's something they wouldn't know. You need to know where there is demand and where there is not. Um, we also then are negotiating discounted prices with each of the major e-commerce platforms to make it more, uh, more, more achievable for them to be able to be successful. And then you get back to being paid. So uh, the e-commerce platforms around the globe are the biggest foreign exchange houses you can possibly get. They rip you off on the foreign exchange. So we are partnering with local um, payment service providers to actually uh, make it cheaper to get to get paid. So I think it's going to that granular, perhaps potentially boring weed stuff, but stuff which makes you uh, be more successful. Because uh, a big issue in the past with the UK is you've often had about 25,000 new exporters each year and 25,000 fewer. Lots and lots of failure in those first instances. So you need to actually to provide them with guided information uh, step by step, specific to their sector, yeah, specific to their sector and to their subsector to help them be successful. But I think e-commerce will only get more and more important, and that's where I think you need to have really targeted support. Nick, you're going to have a whole chapter in your white paper dedicated to SMEs. Um, I, I, I share the view that e-commerce is um, is very much of its time now, and is only going to become more uh, more important. And thinking through. You know what is the support that you want to give both in a very direct sense to SMEs and is that a trade responsibility or is that business or is that um, uh, for Treasury um, uh, to, to look at is something we'll have to to have a very you know a direct conversation I'm sure I suspect it's a, it's a bit of a bit of every department in, in that sense but following on from that um, you know, in a sense, a lot of the low-hanging fruit, for want of a better phrase, in terms of FTAs, um, seems to have been uh, to have been done, and many of those don't um, don't major on services or digital um, trade, and so it feels like the the task um, for government in terms of you know trade negotiations will have a there'll be a big element around digital trade uh, 
um, going um, going forward. Um, and you know, targeting, thinking through which are the markets that you would want to target in terms of a digital trade uh, agreement. You know, clearly there's appetite in terms of the U.S. Although uh, we've had one or two people raise some issues about that um, uh, with us, but um, certainly digital trade going forward big, has got to be a big part of the discussion. So does that mean that you go around upgrading all the low-hanging fruit with uh, for trade deal Mark twos? No, no. Um, what I meant was, um, I, sp I suppose the there are well, we will. I suspect we will enter government and a series of um, uh, FTAs uh, that are will still be will still to be either ratified or s or negotiations on will still to be uh, to be completed. But there is not. I what I suppose what I was saying is not an obvious. Um, set of here's five great FTAs you could you could kickstart um, negotiations on now. My own sense is the biggest wins will be in terms of FTAs will be sorting out the problems we got with Europe, and uh, and completing um, discussions on uh, those FTAs which the government um, can't um, can't can't finish, and we will want to look in detail at um, at at the the space uh, where the government's got to, what it's prioritised and what, what it hasn't prioritised in each of those discussions before we say, yeah, we're going to go in that direction or we're going to go in, um, in that direction. But my point on digital trade is that I think, um, you know, the government have done, to be fair to them, I think they, they did a good agreement uh, with Singapore, um, but uh, I think there's more that we can do in that, in that space. And that feels like a significant direction of travel to try and accelerate um, in the longer term. Marley's nodding enthusiastically. Did you want to come in? Oh, that's a worry. Uh, oh no, just because I, I was going to say, to be fair to the government, they have, they have got this Singapore agreement, which I think they're quite pleased with, and which is meant to be fairly kind of ambitious in the approach. I don't know how effectively it's operating. I don't know whether you've got any insights on that from, from your business perspective. But that is, I think that's something to look at and to see that kind of model. And I guess that is separate to an FTA. So you could, th in theory, kind of negotiate those agreements separately to having to go back to old FTAs and, and, and renegotiate those. Just probably to, to add, I think it's a, it's a generic problem, and I think, I think you alluded to it, um, Gareth, in the sense that a lot of these trade deals are very well negotiated, but SMEs have no idea. Uh, in terms of what they mean. So that's why ultimately I think we do all need to be in partnership because you actually need, if you are, if you are actually selling eyeliners <laughs> to Singapore, that's what you're interested in. How does that land? And I think, you know, at the moment there are lots of different platforms, but they're very generic. And so you need something, just like with Netflix, you're interested in Korean films. You want to get something in Korean films, not latest Hollywood blockbuster. You need to be very specific. So I think that's the challenge. Um, so it, it is a very good agreement with, with Singapore. It's just not very well known by the people actually utilising it. The gentleman in the second row. Uh, thanks, uh, George Perrett, uh, co-chair of the um, Society of Labour Lawyers Business and Trade Group. I just want to make two very short um, legal observations. One on negotiations with the EU. If you want to get something out of the EU which goes beyond the technical review promised in 25-26, you have to get the EU to, you have to persuade the Commission to go through the process of getting a negotiating mandate. So there's a procedure that the EU has to go through. As always in dealing with the EU, you have to remember their procedures, and that take will take some doing. <laughs> um, and one needs to think very carefully about how you're going to persuade them to do that, because that's quite a process on their, their side. Second point, I, a legal point, I very much welcome what um, Gareth was saying about the importance of scrutiny and engagement with um, uh, business and NGOs and uh, uh, civil society on, and, and of course Parliament on, on, on trade agreements and to try and sort of avoid the rabbit out of a hat problem, um, which so particularly as the rabbit so often turns out to be a hamster. Um, uh, which vividly uh, demonstrated by the fact that we still don't have no idea what the Indians are asking for, the point you, you were making. Just one point I would add to that is the importance of involving the devolved governments, and that there's a, there's a serious legal reason behind that, which is that so much of what one has to negotiate in trade agreements these days is regulation, and you're talking about, uh, often talking about areas where those areas have been uh, of devolved responsibilities, obviously agriculture, but all sorts of other things as well. I suppose you're very pleased that it's a lawyer leading the party. Did you want to respond, Gareth? Just, uh, just to say, I, I mean, I take the point about Europe, but 
Um, in the TCA, there are all sorts of, there are a series of uh, dialogues, spaces by dialogue that are deliberately created, um, many of which have not been activated by the current government, which is clearly, uh, clearly madness. And um, I think we will want to, uh, to use and exhaust those um, uh, as much as we uh, as much as we can do to get discussions going, particularly around the TCA, but um, uh, and then to see where that uh, to see where that leads. There's also a political process that is needed for, um, in a sense, Britain to re-engage properly um, with Europe, and we've begun to do that. As uh, Keir demonstrated, um, I think, very uh, obviously with his visit to Paris to see um, to see Macron, but other. Um, other visits are, are taking place um, that are not quite so well publicised to, to drive that um, re-engagement. And your point about the devolved governments, absolutely. Um, we will want to work uh, very much with, uh, with them. But just uh, one of the things that strikes me is the lack of coordination within England. So, and okay, it's more difficult, um, you know, because it's not, um, there are not national representatives in the way that there are in Wales, Scotland and um, often in Northern Ireland. But um, talking to the mayors, who often have a better feel for their, um, their immediate economies than perhaps we do uh, we would do in Whitehall, um, seems an obvious thing to get right. And there are many councils, to be fair, further north that work very well with their areas too. So getting the structure right for that sort of engagement is, seems to me to be key, um, a key part of it going forward as well. Martin, <coughs> Martin Turner from Manchester Economic Forecasting. We do a lot of trade forecasting for firms. Um, Brexit has been characterised as a two-part suicide, a short-term one which we've heard about the loss of trade volumes because of market access restrictions, non-tariff barriers, and then the long-term piece is about the FDI, which is much slower burn and hitting our potential output. <laughs> Labour government needs growth because of the dire fiscal situation. Is there a danger that Labour could be blamed for the second part of that tragedy, for not signalling more to firms that actually we're going to do something on, Brec on access to European markets. It's the biggest bilateral trade relationship in the world, China, EU. <coughs> Is there a danger that Labour could be, with the, with the Brexit purder, Labour could be landed with that second bigger tragedy? Because obviously investment's a huge part of Rachel Reeves's mes message. Yeah. No, I I, I hope not, is the, is the honest truth. We certainly tried um, to set out um, in, in a very di direct way in this conference and um, in the conversations we've had with um, business going forward, um, uh, how we would try and create a more stable uh, regulatory environment in the UK and a more stable um, rela political relationship with, uh, with Europe going forward. Um, to try and give in overseas investors more confidence. Uh, inevitably, they will, I suspect, want to wait. Some of them will want to wait and see um, how things work out in, uh, in, in, in practice. But uh, I hope we'll be able to give them confidence um, going, f going forward. There are a number of business organizations who have approached us with a series of ideas around how to encourage, um, to create an even more investment-friendly um, approach going forward, and we'll, we will look at those uh, those ideas uh, too, because you're absolutely right, trying to get more foreign direct investment and trying to get more UK uh, companies to invest more um, in the UK is going to be crucial, and they'll only do that if they're confident about the direction of travel of, uh, of the British government in terms of the economy. I, a absolutely, that's a fair, perfectly fair point to make. I mean, you also have to wonder whether scrapping the non-DOM regime might put off some of those wealthy foreigners from putting their money into UK PLC? Well, I think people will, um, I hope, look, look at the UK in the round in terms of investment and recognise that, um, uh, you know, overall we are, uh, under a Labour government, we will be a better place to invest in than, um, uh, than perhaps we were, we are at the moment under, uh, under Sunak and before that trust. Um, you know, we have set out um, we've made clear that we're going to have a very difficult economic inheritance and we're going to have to make some tough choices in terms of where we raise, uh, way, raise money and scrapping the non-DOM uh, non status has been one of those areas where we think we can raise significant sums of money for our, for our public services. And I appreciate it um, will not be instantly popular with some 
um, overseas investors as part. I, I hope on balance they will nonetheless look at us um, in a positive light and want to invest here. Thank you. Uh, Ian Mace from Associated British Foods. Um, one comment first, um, which is uh, to be aware of the upcoming EU directive on supply chain due diligence. That's going to make it even harder for our SMEs to understand what they need to do to export to Europe. And that's going to be a real challenge. And it's worth um, thinking about talking to the EU about that in your uh, discussions. Um, and then a question. Um, so it's been uh, reported that the trade deal with India, or the, the bits that have been green so far, are very weak on environment and uh, labour standards. Um, if it gets to the point where it's been agreed by the current government but not yet ratified and not yet gone through the parliamentary processes, would Labour be willing to reopen those, that deal if, it, if, it, if you're not happy with it? That is a fantastic question that I wish I asked myself. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, we will, we will want to, uh, we, in, in, pra in principle, we want to deal with it. We want to see a deal with India for all sorts of, uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, if there isn't progress on labour standards and environment, we will have a difficult choice uh, to make, and we'll have to make a judgment in the round uh, of, about that. Um, what we want to use, uh, one of the reasons why we want to set out a trade, to publish a trade white paper very quickly in the next Labour government, is in a sense to try and give other countries with whom we negotiate with a clear sense of direction as to uh, Labour's future trade policy and, and how we will be approaching negotiations um, going forward. Um, it may well be that we're faced with a, um, uh, a situation where we don't have um, we haven't yet published a, a trade white paper, and we haven't given that, been able to give that level of direction um, going before, uh, setting out that level of direction, and so we'll have a difficult choice, uh, difficult choice to make. Um, but I'm not going to speculate on what's in it because I just, I just don't, I just don't know. J just on India, I think it's, it's a, it's a good point. I think there's, there's a, a disproportionate focus on on very small minutiae and tariffs and tits for tat. So I think your, your point's a good one on a broader arrangement. I think for India, for me, there are three really big points. One is that there will be certain sectors who benefit from India. So each year, um, the increase in the number of Indians who are at drinking age is the same as the population of Australia. So uh, so the whiskey sector, that's why they're so interested in, in India. It's, it's a huge market for them. You then have the issue of, of skills. So each year in India, there are one million new engineering graduates. So does the UK want to get those, some of those to come in, or do they also want to use India as a base for development across Asia? They're the sort of questions I think we should be debating. And the third part, back to China, is India is one of the obvious countries for supply chain diversification. Um, and, but that's where you do need support on ESG. So how can you, how can you assure that there is not child labour, et cetera, et cetera. So, and that's where I think there's probably an opportunity for government to potentially team up and governments to team up to actually get a pooled resource which can go and check factories in different markets in the same way that, um, that, a, that a Zara or a Primax should be doing. Um, these are the things I think a broader debate on trade deals I think would be more useful rather than just focusing on, on a 1% or 2% here and there. Just a couple of points on the on the India deal, and in particular on the on the um, standards point. I mean, I think um, you know we've said that there should be a greater focus on conditionality and trade deals, and thinking about how you embed um, workers' rights, environmental protections into trade deals. I mean, the government, I think, has has in some ways it, it's good to see that some of the trade deals it's negotiated, um, including with New Zealand, for instance, have got good pr protections in them. But it's kind of meaningless if then you you bow to pressure uh, in any other trade deal just because you know the other the other trade partner um, isn't happy with with those protections it's worth saying that a lot of those protections are generally quite weak they're not requiring you know india to conform to uk standards or anything like that they're just requiring um, non regression on on the country's own standards um, um, to, uh, 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 in order to um, attract trade or investment. So it, it, it's, it, these are pretty broad provisions. So, so obviously I don't know what's in the trade deal but it would, or what's being negotiated, but it would, it would be concerning if those were being dropped altogether. Um, the other thing to say on, on, again, we don't know, we can only speculate, but given the focus of, of India on um, 
in the past on wanting to have greater mobility provisions. It will be interesting to see what they are looking for now because the UK in many ways has actually given India unilaterally what it wants in the last few years. Um, you've got a post-study work route, you've got significantly number, uh, a high number of international students coming from uh, India, we've got uh, a much more um, liberalised work visa system. So I'd be interested to know what, what more we can offer in many ways at this point. Thank you. Um, I just want to take the, pa the last few minutes, if you don't mind. We know that Keir Starmer's speech is coming up at 2 o'clock, and I know that you're all looking forward to having a sandwich before it. But we know he's going to focus on this decade of renewal. So I want to ask all of you, each of you, um, starting with you, John, where do you, where do you want to see UK trade at the end of this decade of renewal? I think the UK needs to focus on what they're... What they need to double down on what they think they'll be good at. So if there are certain sectors, and you look at life sciences, parts of manufacturing, um, obviously services and professionals, that's where the UK is well placed on the global stage. Double down on that. Um, be very clear in terms of making a real practical difference. So if, if Brexit's not, if, if, if Remain is not, uh, or rejoining is not on the table, then I think the practical um, aspects can make a real, real difference. But I think that the UK needs to be clear what it, what it wants to do um, and perhaps take some lessons from other countries around the world, not least the US, which is actually um, having a more proactive industrial policy. Then I think it should also look to partner with business. So there's certain things which we can, we can do together. The government should not be expected to solve everything. Business is at heart is a business problem. So I think some sort of joint venture is, is, is crucial. Marley? Yeah, similarly, I think it'd be great to have a, a clear strategy to start with um, and, and a clear strategy that links to, to um, what it looks like um, you know, Labour wants to develop in terms of its industrial policy and seeing that clear connection um, I, and learning, I think, from the Inflation Reduction Act, thinking about how you um, can in, uh, invest strategically and think about how trade policy aligns up with that kind of um, uh, investment, particularly in, 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 in clean energy. Um, and then alongside that, much uh, a more ambitious um, engagement with the US um, and the EU and other trade partners um, when it comes to thinking about what the future rules on green subsidies, on, on, um, on low carbon imports would look like. Gareth, we want ambition. At the end of a decade of renewal, what do you want to see? Listen, I'll, I'll just come back to my, um, the instruction given to me two weeks ago, not to be exciting. Uh, well, I mean, we'll I be back in I, the EU. Uh, uh, I suppose what I'd say is, you know, the, the figures on exports, you know, both to Europe and, you know, globally, last decade and last five years are grim in terms of, um, uh, in terms of what they've meant for lost billions of wealth in this country. And I'd like to see a turnaround in those, uh, in those, in those figures. That'd be the, that's, that's the key. Because in the end, that's where the jobs come. That's where the good jobs uh, come. And that's how people's lives in this country are going to be transformed. All right, thank you all so much and for all the questions. It's been really insightful to hear from you all. So uh, please join me in thanking Marley Morris, uh, John Carroll and Gareth Thomas.